Hello guys, so about two weeks ago I have shown you how I moved into my new room here in Cologne and since then I have made some changes to this room and the most important one is that I added another table so that I could use my first table as a kind of workbench here in my room and this video is about the equipment that I'm going to use on that workbench and so this video will be about fixing this oscilloscope here also doing some minor repairs on this laptop, talking about this component analyzer slash tester and also a little bit about this cheap DMM here. So let's get right into it. So a couple of days ago I drove back to the shop and one thing that I really want to take care of is to find a couple of things that are redundant here in the lab and bring them to my new room in Cologne so that I would have more capabilities for example for electronics repair and other smaller projects. And one thing that is really key is having an oscilloscope. And it just so happens that a couple of weeks ago a German viewer actually sent me this box here which as far as I know contains an oscilloscope. And as you can see I couldn't even find the time up to this point to take a look inside but we're going to do that now. So what we have here is a rather old-fashioned Harmeck oscilloscope manufactured in West Germany so that would have been before 1990 and to be more precise this is a Harmeck HM605 50 megahertz analog dual channel oscilloscope and it is actually much more capable than my old 20 megahertz Harmeck oscilloscope that I have been using in this lab up to this point and if we can get this thing running that'd be more than enough for Cologne. But before I will dare to switch on the oscilloscope in order to test it, there are unfortunately some obvious damages that have to be taken care of first. Now first of all these two knobs here that lead to the potentiometers for the intensity and focus adjustment are loose and can no longer be used for their purpose. Also when you turn this device around and look at the back side you can see that the plastic sheet that covers the back of the oscilloscope is broken in several spots and also the part that is holding these BNC connectors here is totally bent out of shape. But it appears that we are sort of lucky and that none of the electronics were actually damaged. So I can simply plug in these rods leading from the knobs to the potentiometers near the power supply of the oscilloscope and here you can see that I can now turn them again. And then I simply temporarily unscrew this aluminium sheet holding the BNC connectors and somewhat bend them back into shape with a set of pliers. And since these were all mechanical defects that I found at that time, I put it all back together and connected it to the self-made Wien bridge generator in order to do some basic tests of the oscilloscope. So there seem to be no problems with the basic features of the oscilloscope so I brought it with me to Cologne. And here I am cleaning the oscilloscope properly before putting it on the workbench permanently. And while I was doing that I also found that there was yet another little issue and that was with this inverter button here or inversion button. It was stuck in place and you couldn't pull it out anymore so I had to open the oscilloscope again and adjust this metal rod sitting on this black plastic piece pushing down this switch. And you will find a lot of these rods inside these oscilloscopes and that is because you want to keep all the switches and potentiometers and so on exactly in that space where they belong in the circuit and you do not want to draw out the signal path to the front panel. And that is in order to minimize the inductance of the paths and to minimize the noise that is coupled into the path and so on. But the oscilloscope was now in working order again and I could go on to fix the next device. Now here are two laptops that have been sent here by a German viewer a couple of weeks ago and I have shown that in a mailbag section back then. The left one is a Dell Latitude D620 and the right one a D630. 
The left one has one gigabytes of RAM, while the right one has about four gigabytes of RAM and is overall better. Now, these machines are already between eight and 10 years old and only the right one will still be good for anything in 2016, I guess. And so I bought a new larger battery pack and this cheap replacement charger here for the D630. But as you can see here, there is an issue with the screen, a couple of lines do simply not work anymore. And I think that's because of some connection issue either with the panel itself or with the wire connecting the panel to the laptop. And I will now simply try to swap the two screens of the D620 and D630 because I think that I am never going to use the D620 anyway. But before I tried that, I connected an external monitor to the laptop, as you can see here, to check that the issue wasn't with the graphics chip of the laptop, which obviously is not the case. Now, normally I try to use German tools and I have a lot of them back in my actual workshop. But here in Cologne, I'm willing to compromise a little bit. And here I bought myself for 10 bucks this screwdriver set here that I'm going to use to fix the laptop. Before I tried to actually swap the screens, I first removed these little rubber pieces here that cover the screws that hold the outer plastic frame around the panel. And normally you wouldn't have to do that, but I wanted to check if I can maybe see if there is a broken connection in one of the wires connecting the screen to the laptop. But that wasn't the case. So if you just want to swap a screen, you don't really have to do this. And in the next step, I can now simply lever off this plastic panel that holds the power button and some of these other buttons right here. And under that, I find a couple of screws that hold the keyboard module in place. And after unscrewing those, I can simply pull out the keyboard, then flip it upside down and put it out of my way, but without the need of disconnecting it from the main board. And here we can see the main connector that leads from the screen module to the actual laptop and I unplug that. And we also have here the Wi-Fi module of the laptop where we find several wires that are connected to it. Some of them are leading to nothing right now, but some of them are leading to the screen module where you can also find the actual Wi-Fi antennas apparently. And after having unplugged all those wires, you can then unscrew the screen by first unscrewing the screws on the back side and then also on the bottom side of the laptop. And now the entire screen module can just be pulled out. And of course, in the next step, I do exactly the same thing to the D620. And after having done that, I can now physically install the screen of the D620 to the D630 and reconnect the wires and the keyboard, but won't install the plastic panel for now because I first want to test if everything is working. And as you can see, there are no issues with the screen anymore. And now I can simply reinstall that plastic panel, but still in the hope that I might find some obvious problem with the wire of the other screen. I took it apart a little more to check the wires, but couldn't find the fault. So I just put it into the D620 and now of course it has the same issue as the D630 before, but that really doesn't matter because I only need the better of the two anyway. So with that being out of the way, the next thing I want to talk about is this component analyzer slash tester, which I bought for, I guess, 12 euros on Amazon, which is really dirt cheap if you compare that to other devices that I have been using in my shop in the last couple of years for the same purposes. Now, first I need some components in order to test that and I don't have any with me. So what I did is to pull this printer scanner unit here from the trash this morning and I am taking out the power supply unit that can be simply plugged in and out and I cut that open with my Dremel, yet another cheap gadget that I bought for Cologne basically and I desolder all of these through hole components that I can get with this seven euro soldering iron here that I really cannot recommend. But with a lot of hassle, I have been able to pull a lot of the components of the PCB and now we can perform some basic tests here. So this 12 euro component tester is really based on an Atmel 32.8 it has a display with backlight, is powered by a 9 volt battery and has a 5 volt linear regulator on the board. 
It has three soldering pads where test leads could be soldered onto, but it doesn't come with that. Instead, you have a socket with lots of pins, but any of them are only connected to pins one, two, and three, as you can see by the numbers on top of the socket. And this device is basically a combination of an LCR meter and a semiconductor tester. At this point in time and right here and right now, I don't have the capability or the time to test this properly, but let's just check what readings we get from our components. And of course, as an LCR meter, this should be capable of measuring resistances, but I don't have any purely resistive components at hand. So I'm measuring one of the windings on this little filter choke right here. And as you can see, it gives you an inductance readout as well as a resistance readout for the series resistance of the inductor. And that implies, of course, that it can also measure resistances. And here we have another choke. And again, I connect the two ends of one of the windings on this choke to two pins on the socket. And here you can see that the inductance of one of the windings on the so-called common mode choke is much higher than the inductance of the smaller filter choke we measured before. So I don't have the exact specs here, but it can measure a wide variety of inductance values and that's already worth a lot. And you could also use this, for example, to measure the inductance of unknown windings on transformer cores, which can then be used to derive the number of turns or the ratio between different windings on an unknown transformer. But I will have to explain that in a future video, I guess. So now let us test some capacitive components and also do the same thing with the Unity UT139C digital multimeter that I recently bought and then compare those two values. And here we have a 56 microfarads electrolytic capacitor. And as you can see, the tester also displays an ESR for equivalent series resistance value. So not only does this device combine an LCR meter and also a semiconductor tester, but also an ESR meter. And now let's just compare some capacitance measurements from the tester and the multimeter. Ten point something microfarads. Two nanofarads. And here I'm measuring a thirty three picofarad ceramic capacitor. And the tester seems to do well, while the DMM seems to be incapable of measuring such low capacitances. And now let's try it with some semiconductor components. Here we have just a standard silicon rectifier diode with a forward voltage around 600 millivolts. And it of course identifies the leads of the component correctly. Now here we have a so-called ultra fast rectifier diode and it displays a forward voltage at around one half volt. This is a Zener diode. And of course it can measure the forward voltage around 700 millivolts. But of course you actually want to know the Zener voltage, but that doesn't work because the Zener voltage is higher than the actual supply voltage of the tester. Otherwise it should be able to do that as well. And now let's insert the power transistor that I salvaged from the power supply unit. And as you can see, I wasn't able to uh, remove the heatsink because the screw is all broken and well, I couldn't get it loose. But as you can see here, the tester is capable of identifying this as a N-channel enhancement mode MOSFET, which is of course correct. And you have also the pin out of the MOSFET and then also the threshold voltage and even the gate capacitance. But both the tester and this cheap DMM aren't worth much if you can compare the values to the measuring values of better equipment. So this is not a proper test, of course. But I think that this workbench that I have here and this setup can be enough for a lot of projects that I have been working on in the past or might be working on in the future. And let's just see what I'll come up with next week with this stuff here. And I hope you like this and see you soon.